Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. To serious matters then, you might remember a couple of years ago on the programme, not long after the programme began, I interviewed a couple of times a uh, woman called Melanie Shaw. Now, Melanie came on the programme to talk about her experiences at Beechwood Children's Home in Nottingham. Um, It was harrowing stuff. She um, was abused as a child at home and was then abused again when she was in the care of this Beechwood Children's Home, which was, at that time, run by Nottingham County Council. It's believed by, in my opinion, some very credible people and very credible researchers that because she blew the whistle on this and named names and threw the spotlight on those doing it and played a big part in Operation Daybreak, which she did because it was her testimony to the police that got Operation Daybreak underway. It's the belief of a lot of people that she's being persecuted for having the courage and, in their opinion, I suppose, the temerity to come out against this. The interview I did with her uh, two and a half, well, two and a quarter, I suppose, years ago, is on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, if later on you want to have a listen to it. Now, we learned last week that she was sentenced to two years in prison. And it's bizarre because we can't determine why she was sent to, uh, to sentenced to two years in prison, why the 11 months she'd been in prison on remand hadn't been deducted from her sentence, What's going on? Because it was all in a secret court. Now, to talk about this, because he's on top of the case, he's followed it uh, diligently. He's a friend of Melanie's, and um, he's got a great history himself. He is a former Nobel Peace Prize nominee, as I mentioned earlier on, but he's also been a um, long-time campaigner against uh, child abuse. And, of course, as I mentioned earlier on, with the Holly Gregg case, he found himself incarcerated for asking questions and that was back in 2012 and we will talk about that as well because we have plenty of time lots of time and no pressure that should be our tagline let's welcome to the program for the first time it's uh, a pleasure to welcome him robert green robert welcome to the program how are you i'm fine thank you very much richie and uh, thank you very much for being so kind as to uh, invite me on today it's a great pleasure and uh, I'd just like to thank those people, perhaps just before I forget, I'm always forgetting to thank people that I should thank. Um, you, you and I, of course, looked, uh, with uh, David Icke on, uh, on uh, Saturday in Manchester. And uh, I'd just like to say, if you're listening, any of those very kind people who uh, came up to me when, when I was there and uh, offered their support and said they've been supporting the Holly Gregg case for many years, thank you very much indeed for your very kind remarks. I do appreciate uh, all the support that you've given. You've been very loyal and very good, so thank you. Sure. So there we are. There's my little thank you. To well, very, very nice of you to say that, and I'm sure those people you bumped into will appreciate that. Um, it is kind of strange that you've not been on with us over the last couple of years, but I suppose um, all the better you're on now. Yes, well, I there's a lot going on. We've got a lot going on, Richie, and I have to say, you, you really describe the situation with Me- with Melanie very well indeed. I can't really add to that. I think it is, is a, 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 a a terrible thing that's going on here, irrespective of of what may or may not have happened, what Melanie may or may not have done. I think the way she's been treated now is absolutely inhumane. It sounds to me something, and I'm not exaggerating, something that the way people might have been treated in Nazi Germany or under the the Stasi. It seems totally out of, um, uh, or or shall we say, we hopefully out of character of how uh, how people are treated in prisons in this country. It seems very serious to me. And the secrecy uh, is the worst element that, uh, by all accounts, Melanie is not allowed to make connections with people, independent people, independent witnesses. We've got secret courts. She's apparently having mail withheld. Uh, So the the way she's been treated is just appalling by all accounts. And uh, it would seem that the state is is, uh, um, taking action against uh, Melanie because she's been prepared to speak out and Although, again, it's not really my case, although I, I, I've spoken to Melanie in the past, as, as uh, Richie alluded to, 
the the difficulty there is that she really is so isolated and nobody really knows what has happened and nobody knows why she's been treated in the way that she does but could it be that she has been uh, named a few people who uh, the authorities would prefer not to be named and it's hard um it's hard not to come to that conclusion isn't it i mean we try to be yeah. objective and I've, I've watched a lot of your videos and to your credit robert you come at it from a very I would describe it as kind of a very academic, um, you know, way. I, 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 that's what I get from you anyway, and that's why I was so anxious to get you on this programme. Can you tell our listeners what you know about Beechwood Children's Home in Nottingham? What went on there? The sorts uh, of things well, that Melanie well, was talking about. Yes, I, 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 say, I, I don't claim to be able to speak with any great authority on this case, um, but what I, I understand is that Beechwood and other children's homes in the area uh, within those ho- care homes, there was a, a, a systematic uh, sexual abuse of many children. And this, what make, this is what makes the, the, the way in which Melanie's being treated even more strange, because unlike some of the other cases, including the, the Holly Gray case, it isn't just one person coming forward here. Many children who were uh, in the homes have come forward, and I understand that the uh, Nottingham Council or Nottinghamshire Council have paid out a lot of these people from public funds because of the of the way they were treated as victims of this abuse. So Melanie's not on her own. She's speaking. Uh, she's making the same kind of allegations in the same kind of places that uh, many other people have. So there's, it's impossible to really discredit Melanie because she's only saying the other, the, the same things that many other victims have said, and those victims have been believed. So I, I think it's a complete mystery. Uh, so but that's really basically the uh, the uh, the basis of all this. Um, obviously, because of the, the sheer num- the sheer scale, there have been people who have been saying that this, the, the number of people abused in the Nottingham area, both in the city and perhaps in the surrounding areas in Nottinghamshire, may well come up to the sort of figure that we've heard about in Rotherham, as far as victims are concerned. So perhaps the authorities really want to make an example of Melanie to stop more people coming forward. I don't, I, just, know. Um, I don't know the answer, but obviously the authorities are not acting in an open or transparent way, and they do seem to be bringing suspicion upon themselves. We may be wrong in all this. I may not be right in my suspicions, but why are they being so secretive about this? This is the, that is the question. No, you're right. The, the, the JFK quote was mentioned by a guest last night, secrecy is repugnant in a... You know, in a free society. I, I just want to, to back up what you're saying there, we can't forget that the last time I spoke with um, Melanie, she'd been sentenced to uh, time in Peterborough Prison for allegedly setting fire to a neighbour's shed. Now, what staggered me, because I, I'm kind of, I, I'm experienced enough over the years, I've interviewed so many different people, that when somebody tells you something, you take it with a pinch of salt. So when Melanie yeah. said to me, there's not even any evidence that a shed was burned down, I took it with a pinch of salt, only to find out that there was never any report made to the fire services in the area. There was no complaint made. They never were called out to any such fire. And, um, you know, she was banged up for that. And, 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 and I knew then that somebody had it in for this woman. Yes, yes. Uh, well, you've, I heard the same thing, uh, Richie. That's sort of how I understood the situation. In fact, again, when she was in Peterborough at the uh, Sodexo private prison there, uh, again, she uh, received, uh, it seems, very similar kind of treatment to what is reported she is suffering from at uh, Foston Hall at the moment, HMP Foston Hall, where she is at the moment, which is uh, in Derbyshire, uh, um, not too far from the Staffordshire border. And uh, when she was, uh, as I say, was following the case, like, as many of you were, many other people were, and I heard about the, um, that she had a, a very bad injury on her leg that she claimed was being untreated. And uh, a lot of pressure was put on various people uh, uh, in the, the government to try and do something about this, including Karen Bradley, who was uh, the Minister for Preventing Abuse and Exploitation at the time. But uh, nothing happened there. And, uh, in fact, I, uh, I got in touch with uh, Sarah Champion, the uh, Labour MP, who has uh, uh, been very helpful in the Rotherham area. It was her constituency where all these terrible things happened to, to young girls there. And uh, Sarah was very helpful. And in very short order, I got a, a letter from the, uh, the Home Office 
and uh, in it it said, it's 24th of September 2015, and in it it said, I'm very sorry to hear about the case of Melanie Shaw and the sexual abuse she suffered as a child. Child sexual abuse is a reprehensible crime no matter when or where it occurs. The government is committed to keeping children and young people safe from all forms of abuse. We are clear that if, a child, if child abuse takes place, it must be thoroughly and properly investigated and those responsible brought to justice. Yes, you said that, Home Office. I've got the letter in front of me here. So why aren't you, why aren't you looking into this and looking into Melanie's allegations seriously? Well, that's a question. But that comes from the Home Office directly. I'd also made some. I'd also made uh, an effort then uh, when I heard about Melanie's, uh, you know, uh, difficulties and health problems. Um, it seemed quite quite uh, definite that uh, she was not being dealt with properly. So I actually rang the Home Secretary's office. That was Theresa May at the time, and I told them what I, I obviously didn't get a chance to speak to the Home Secretary, but one of the staff. And I explained that uh, I'd been told about this situation in uh, the Sodexo prison in Peterborough and the treatment of this particular, um, uh, in, particular inmate. And I said that I understood that her health uh, may be in danger. And I made the point then that I said, if, if now I have told you, if any harm befalls this young lady, if she's taken ill, or if she were to die, which was, po which was possible on, on the, based on the information I've been given, that I would personally see that the Home Secretary would be held responsible for that, having told them about this, if the allegations are true. Uh, as it happens, in very short order, the uh, Melanie was became treated much, much better indeed. But that's just a, a, a point I'd like to make for all the people who are concerned about people being uh, treated badly, especially if they're incarcerated. If you learn about not only Melanie, but any other cases, please don't be afraid to contact the Home Office straight away and uh, give them the same kind of message that uh, I gave them over Melanie. That's it, it very important. Work. That's very important that, you know, weight of numbers. I would urge your yeah. listeners to email the Home Office and ask about the whereabouts and the health and the the condition of of melanie and you know i'm glad you you mentioned you know melanie obviously has some problems look i yes, yes. Uh, well, well who wouldn't the well that's exactly what i was going to say sexual abuse that Absolutely. She suffered as a child how could you possibly not have problems in later life when those awful things have happened to you in your formative years do you know what robert i have no evidence to support this and it's probably something i wouldn't do if I was on mainstream media, but I'm going to do it anyway. I wouldn't be surprised because she has issues. I wasn't sexually abused, but I was badly physically physically abused as a youngster. And I acted out a lot into my late teens. You know, I properly acted out and I was a problem. I didn't, I never hurt anybody, but I acted out and I caused people embarrassment and problems. And I, I could see a situation where the enemies of Melanie, knowing what she's going through and her mental condition, would... Um, you know, deliberately engineer her into situations where she might yeah. say something or she might lash out in order to whip, whip out the handcuffs. There you go, love. Bang, you're caught. You're arrested under such and such a section of such and such a law. And then, you know, and that's why she spent so much time in prison over the last few years. It staggers yes. me and it's horrible to think this woman has been sentenced to jail for two years. And as of today, the 17th of January, Robert, nobody knows for what. No, that is it's the staggering, point. isn't it? The secrecy, even the court case was actually, they did everything to cover it up so that nobody could be there, no press, no members of the public could know what was going on. And Melanie, of course, has been isolated from the outside world. We understand, we have a reason to understand that her mail has been intercepted. And for that reason, some of you, perhaps listeners, may know this already, but uh, we've decided several of us who have been trying to help Melanie decide the very best way of uh, trying to make sure that she gets her mail is to be uh, to route it via her MP, uh, Chris Leslie. That's, uh, he's a man, L-E-S-L-I-E, -E, Chris Leslie, and his address, uh, it, it's on the net, and you can find it yourself anyway, but I will just tell you verbally, it's uh, 12 Regent Street, Nottingham, NG1 5BQ. And uh, I've done this already. I've sent a letter to Melanie, and I've sent a covering letter to Mr. Leslie to tell him about the situation and the fact that it sounds suspiciously like torture in the uh, the international uh, internationally accepted way of of uh, of, uh, to, of what how defining how torture is. 
and uh, I've suggested that he takes immediate action to protect his uh, constituents, and I understand a former employee. I think she actually worked for him, and I think there's a rather nice picture of uh, Melanie and uh, Mr. Leslie uh, chatting amicably together. So, uh, Mr. Leslie, if you're listening, or if any of your staff are listening, or any of your constituents in the Nottingham area, uh, I think it's time that you did something about your constituent and uh, helped to protect her from the terrible treatment that she appears to be receiving at the moment, and it is not for the first time. Robert, thanks. We're going to leave that. It's at Chris Leslie MP on Twitter as well, at Chris Leslie. And just to reiterate what Robert already told you, and I'm sure you understand, you understood him perfectly. He's got a great speaking voice. But I'm going to do it again anyway. 12 Regent Street, Nottingham, uh, November Golf 1, NG1, 5B for Bravo, Q for whatever, Quincy, Quince, whatever. So NG1, 5B, Q. I don't know my... I don't know my um, a phonetic answer. I think it's Quebec, I think. It but is it Quebec. Well done. Time, well done. Yes. <laughs> no, you're spot on. I think, I think everyone's got the message now. <laughs> they have, mate. I'll tell you what we're going to do, Robert. We're going to take a very, very quick break, 90 seconds. And when we come back, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to turn my microphone off and I'm going to ask you to tell your story and the Holly Gregg story um, as if you're telling it for the first time and nobody ever heard it because it's well, uh, well, massive, well, uh, right? Uh, actually, that would take me about five hours. <laughs> you can condense it. We've well, got, well, from I'm, now we've we, got we an hour. We have that long, but no, I, I'll try to be as brief as I possibly no, can. You, you, I've heard you do it before. the relative what people need to do at this time if they are uh, able to do so. We will do. Right, stand by then. Thanks, uh, um, Robert. Thank Robert you, Robert's, Robert's going to stay with us. He's not going anywhere. We're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, and I know this because I've had emails from people today saying I'm glad you're uh, covering the Holly Gregg situation, Richie, because I don't know very much about it. Uh, of course, people in the UK who listen to this programme, they know all about Robert. Um, they've um, seen his uh, story with respect to what happened to him when he was investigating Holly Gregg. They've come through davidike.com. David reported on Robert and all of that. So in the UK, yes, but outside the UK, a lot of people are sketchy about it. And this is a very important story. So very quick break. Back with plenty more on the Richie Allen Show in association with davidike.com. And you're very welcome back. It's four minutes past the hour. The Nobel Peace Prize nominee a couple of years ago, Robert Green, is on the line, a campaigner against child abuse. We've spoken about Melanie Shaw. I've just tweeted Chris Leslie's Twitter handle. It's at Chris Leslie MP, and I've directed you, if you want to ask questions about Melanie's um, uh, well-being, uh, direct them to, uh, to Chris. And again, like I said earlier on, and don't think I'm in any way uh, lecturing here, uh, be polite. Always be polite and be civil when you're dealing with anybody, no matter who it is. So it's Chris Leslie there. Robert, thanks for staying with us. Good to have you on the programme. I, I want to hear about, uh, I'd love to hear about um, Holly Gregg. Who is Holly Gregg and how did you come to hear about her? Uh, yes. Uh, well, Holly, Holly Gregg um, has uh, a, a lady of extraordinary courage, uh, a staggering bravery. If ever there was a, a woman of the year in the UK, I think Holly Gregg should be in the running. Um, she suffers from uh, Down syndrome, uh, but uh, she's a, a competent person. She's got a great sense of humor and an incredibly, uh, uh, I can't really find the words to describe properly, but she's uh, 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 got a tremendous personality. Uh, as a lot of people who do have Down syndrome have, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's a really very unfortunate, all the rest of it, but they, that many of them have wonderful gifts that perhaps the rest of us can only marvel at, and uh, Melanie and uh, Holly Gregg is one of those people. Um, I, was, I, I first became involved, although I, I uh, live in England, um, I was involved uh, when I was invited up to Scotland to talk about a case I'd been dealing with earlier re involving um, the corruption in the travel and airline industries and uh, involving certain senior officers in the Metropolitan Police. Uh, and a senior and a very a big law firm in London. And uh, ITV did a, a program about it, uh, only scratching the surface, but uh, a lot of people watched it. And as a result of that, I was invited up to Scotland to talk about that to uh, Edinburgh. Um, after I'd given my talk, uh, the, uh, the, the chairman and a few of his, his colleagues asked me if I could do anything at all about a case in Scotland. Uh, and I was told it was one of the most horrific cases that one could imagine, and it concerned the multiple rape of a disabled girl from Aberdeen, Holly Gregg. 
Um, now, to begin with, of course, I, I had no experience of this type of thing at all. I was rather like, I think, most of the people that I, I've been talking to or in the early days talked to in that they found the abuse of children so horrific that they really didn't want to hear about it. And I must admit, I was one of those people before I became involved in this. But when you read, come to realize about the horrors of what these children are suffering, it is not right, not morally right to stand back and say, oh, it's not my child, I don't want to hear about that. It's awful, it's horrible, I don't want to hear it. Well, if you don't want to hear about it, what do you think it's like for the victim, how they must feel? But anyway, as a result of that, uh, to cut a long story short, um, despite the fact I knew nothing about this, I'd never been to Aberdeen in my life where the uh, offences were alleged to have taken place, but I was assured that uh, Holly's mother, Anne, had actually been assiduous in keeping all kinds of documents. She tried very hard to seek justice for her daughter and had uh, a, a, a number of very, very important independent expert witness documents in support of Holly's allegations. The problem being that none of the people named, and apparently there were simply 22 of them, had ever been uh, questioned or hardly any of them had ever been questioned by the police about this matter. So, um, I, I, first of all, I was a little bit reluctant because I thought, well, I've got enough on with the case I was dealing with. Um, but um, I did agree in the end that I would contact um, Holly's mother, who had uh, had to flee from Scotland to Shropshire as a result of the persecution she was receiving in Scotland. And uh, when I, I met her, um, she showed me all the documentation. And it is very important for people who are just listening now and perhaps a few of the people who perhaps know about the case but have had any skeptical in any kind of way, uh, is that uh, I took the case only because of the expert witness documents, which I could reply. If it had just been a matter of Holly making allegations with nothing to back them up whatsoever, I couldn't really have done anything about it. I, I really don't see what I really could have done that would be been of, of value. But in this case, the, the documentary evidence was absolutely staggering. I very much doubt if I, I really can't speak for, for anybody else, but I would be astonished if there's any rape victim in the whole of the country who has so much supporting expert witness evidence uh, uh, as Holly Gregg had. Uh, Robert, there's, Robert, there's, can I jump in there just, just very quickly? You're talking about medical evidence, right? Yes, I am, yes. Physical evidence. Yes, yes, I am. And as you yes. said, the statements and the testimony of other people, this is very important. Oh, yes, it's, it's, it's not my opinion about yeah, this. Yeah, I, yeah. Obviously, I, I, I have a very high regard for Holly and for a mother Anne who's been so brave. But uh, the, the point is that I was depending entirely on expert witness documents. Now, before I looked at the documents, I was aware of one very important thing that sounded very supportive to me indeed. And that was that as a result of uh, a mother Anne's efforts, um, Holly had received a payment from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority as a genuine victim of sexual abuse. Now, that is public money, and that is not given lightly. And the, although the, the level of uh, proof is not the same as perhaps to convict anybody in, uh, uh, of criminal offences, it's still quite high, and the, the, uh, the authority really has to be satisfied that the, uh, the evidence is strong enough to indicate very strongly that the person concerned really is a, a genuine victim rather than an alleged victim, and that is what they have decided. So that in itself, I think, was, was really rather significant. Now, of course, the I have copies of the evidence on which they had relied, and uh, the main evidence was from the two people who had been brought in, two experts. One was Dr. Eva Harding, who was brought in not by Anne herself, but by Nicholas Smith, who was the solicitor for Enable, who are the, um, the leading charity in Scotland uh, who uh, help um, disabled people if they have any issues. So they had uh, actually contacted a person they trusted very much, uh, Dr. I say, Dr. Eva Harding, and Dr. Harding examined Holly and gave a very, very detailed uh, uh, professional opinion of what had happened to her. She had absolutely no doubt that she was a victim of sexual abuse. And indeed, uh, although uh, because of restrictions placed upon me, I can't say too much on that, but what I can say is Dr. Harding had actually named categorically two of the people uh, that who, who Holly had abused as definite abusers. So this came from a very high level indeed. 
and that document along with a document from another leading expert uh, Dr. Jack Boyle of Glasgow leading uh, psychotherapist with great experience in dealing with the uh, victims of sexual abuse um, uh, that are also totally supportive of Holly and uh, while I'm talking about Dr. Boyle, who I think is generally regarded as one of the, the finest professionals in the whole of the country on this, uh, 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 in this regard, uh, there is something that I would like to read out that um, is important to every other case involving child abuse. And it should never be forgotten by anybody. It should be always regarded by any child coming forward, anybody representing children. And it should certainly be uh, re held in regard by the police and by the courts. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Boyle was uh, totally supportive of Holly, again, as Dr. Hardy had been. But this is what he has to say in general. And I will just read this out. In general, the research indicates that children do not make up false stories of sexual abuse, although obtaining information from children with learning difficulties is very difficult. The perpetrator in all cases has enormous motivation to deny and make accusations such as the child is lying, misunderstands normal behavior, or has been primed by mother. So that is the opinion of uh, Dr. Dr. Jack Boyle, and that to me means that any child coming forward who's been sexual abused, and I'm certainly uh, sort of looking very hard at the child abuse inquiry in, uh, certainly in, uh, in England at the present time, that children who come forward our, uh, this is a top professional saying that they do not usually make up false stories of sexual abuse. So that logically means that most of the children are telling the truth. And whatever the situation, if that is how the top professional thinks about this, then it means that every single time children do come forward, then at least a thorough investigation is required. And that must apply to every case that comes before the police in this country. You could only conclude what you did conclude based on all of that evidence. First of all, the payout, which, as you yeah. said, wasn't, you know, on the, the lines of the burden of proof as pertaining to a criminal case, but still very significant councils and authorities don't give money away and governments don't give money away to people on a whim. Yeah. So you had that. Then you had yeah. Dr. Harding, Dr. Boyle's testimonies, all those other documents. How could you come to any other conclusion then uh, the young well, girl, well, heaven well, help her, was, well, was you raped. Couldn't. The, the evidence is overwhelming. And it isn't, doesn't stop there. There's more. Mm -hmm. We have very uh, good uh, reports um, supporting Holly and the way that she perhaps the police had not handled the case properly from uh, um, two of the top professionals at the Down Syndrome Association, uh, Susanna Seaman and Ruth Beckman. Uh, we also had, um, uh, uh, perhaps again, perhaps even more importantly, a report from Grampian police themselves. The uh, investigating officer, when Holly first made her allegations in 2000, was in fact D Detective Inspector Ian Alley. And the uh, letter bore the name of the Chief Constable at that time, Andrew Brown, QPM. And within the letter, uh, it was again extremely supportive of Holly. And uh, D.I. Alley uh, told us that in the letter indicated that all the police officers who had dealt with Holly regarded her as a genuine, a, a genuine person a vic and a, a thoroughly innocent victim. And this had been supported, as the, as the IRL put his letter, by the, the um, forces forensic medical officer, a lady called Dr. Frances Kelly, who had found for certain, having examined her physically, that indeed she had been the victim of sexual abuse. So this came from the police. So this was all there. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we got some more evidence from another doctor, uh, Dr. Paul Carter, who was the, uh, the uh, doctor at the school that Holly attended, which coincidentally was also called Beechwood School in Aberdeen. And he had also put two reports in, uh, again, fully supporting Holly, that he had very great concerns uh, after physically examining her that she'd been involved in, uh, in sexual abuse. And I, I should, I'm really loath to say too many things here that would embarrass no, or cause any problems, that, yeah. but one thing that I, I, I should say, and this in a way sickens almost everybody, is that at the age of 10, um, Holly had received a uh, infection that is normally transmitted sexually. That was at the age of 10. At the age of 10. Yes. I spoke, I actually rang uh, Dr. Carter when I got hold of these documents, 
He was then practicing as a general, as a GP in the Midlands, and uh, he confirmed everything that he put in his articles, in his reports, and uh, he, he was uh, absolutely deeply shocked that nothing had happened as a result of him uh, putting these reports out that he sent to the head teacher of the school. Let me do a quick recap. It's exactly yeah. 16 and a half minutes past the year. Robert Green is on the line. Robert is a former Nobel Peace Prize nominee. He's a campaigner against child abuse. He was in Scotland a few years ago working on another case and he was asked to look at the case of Holly Gregg, a young girl with Down syndrome, the learning disability. What he discovered when looking at the uh, massive amount of documentation and evidence by, uh, presented him by Holly's mother uh, including that there was a payout made to Holly um, because of what had happened to her, the medical evidence, the testimony um, by Dr. Boyle, the psychotherapist and Dr. Harding, uh, the police accounts. Um, all of this evidence led him to believe, to conclude that uh, Holly um, was indeed a victim of rape and sexual abuse. And of course, Robert, now we move on to, you must have been, you, so you're flabbergasted, you're wondering how, yes. how with all of that evidence... Why is Holly's mother still demanding justice uh, and accountability for her daughter? That's what you... And, and this is where the story moves on. Why is she yes, not getting gets, anywhere with this information? Well, uh, well, it's, it, it's very difficult to know for sure, but obviously there's, what is certain is that the Scottish um, authorities, and I will come on to this later, it includes... Uh, have covered this up at the very highest level. I do mean the very highest level, and I'm going to talk about this in detail. Uh, First Minister Alex Salmond and current First Minister Nicola Sturgeon are absolutely culpable, and they have broken the law. They've been proven to have broken the law in trying to cover up the Holly Gregg case. And I will give you some more details about this in a little while because I think people should be doing something about it, especially if they're living in Scotland at the moment. They should be asking questions of their MPs and MSPs and possibly MEPs about why this is this has occurred and how it is that both uh, Mr. Salmond and Ms. Sturgeon remain in office. Because when the truth gets out about this, and it has been uh, concealed, forcibly concealed by the Scottish government, then I think the people of Scotland will realise that they have been betrayed and deceived for far too long. Robert, could it, be, could it be the case, um, I mean, obviously Salmond and Sturgeon are not here to yeah. defend themselves, could it be the case, and it happens all the time, I've been covering politics yeah. for donkey years, that um, whatever they might or might not have done might not have been malicious, might be down to you know, not knowing all the facts about oh, it. Oh, oh, no, oh, no, actually, I, I will, I, I anticipated that um, uh, to you, uh, uh, Richard. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I can say is all the documents that once I'd realised it and found that the Scottish government, had, the Scottish police had done nothing about it, I forwarded copies, all of these, to uh, Alex Salmond, who was the First Minister at that time, and these were acknowledged as being received. So the evidence that I was looking at had been received by the, uh, the, by the offices, the by the offices of the first minister. Oh, now, look, oh yes, again, yes, I'm not. Uh, I'm going to get fact, hammered now. I'm going to get hammered for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, and look, I'm not saying I think it's likely, but I, again, I've been around mainstream media and I've been around politicians. There is the possibility that Salmond and Sturgeon may not have been shown this by their respective oh, um, oh, entourages, well, well, right? Uh, Richie, if I may stop you there, stop um, me. There is actually a clip of me handing over the document, I'd already posted them to Mr. Salmond, and he'd done nothing. On, on the, um, the 1st of May 2011, Mr. Salmond arrived in Perth to uh, uh, be interviewed on BBC about the uh, coming uh, election uh, in 2011. Uh, that was the, uh, the Scottish election. And uh, yeah, there is a clip that you can see where I actually hand him copies of his documents. They put it into his hand. I tell him who I am, and it's about the Holly Gregg case. And you will see Mr. Salmon say, I'll take a look at these. Fantastic, so there Robert. there it is. There's no, there's brilliant stuff. So you handed them to him, so there's no excuse. Oh, absolutely. He so has there, them. there is no question about his culpability in this. He knows all about it, and he has done nothing. And you've and never heard from them since? Yes. Um, so, anyway, just before we get back to that, I'm going to read you some documents about... Um, what just just before you do, Robert, just before you do, obviously, um, b because, I mean, obviously you've handed him the documents and we know that, and that's, uh, that, that's you know, a matter of historical fact and record. We will, of course, um, write to 
um, the former First Minister and ask him, has he read the information that you gave him? We know you gave it to him. And if yeah. he has read it, um, could he give some response, uh, give some answer, give us some indication of what he thinks about that information? It's incumbent upon us now as a yes. you know, semi-decent programme to do that, so we will yes. do it. Now I'll shut up and you can talk about the documents. Uh, yes. Well, actually, as it happens, I think while we're just on this subject, rather than go off it and come back to it again a little bit later, I think uh, it's probably best I give you all the details now, because there's far more than that. Um, on the 3rd of June... Um, the, a very respectable uh, ma- magazine called The Firm, it's a legal magazine, so it's only usually read by people in the legal profession in Scotland, um, gave a headline, exclusive, Information Commissioner forces government response to Holly Gregg inquiries. And uh, this, was, uh, this was published, it's a, it's a public document and so forth, and it, it makes the point that on the 26th of May 2011, the whole of the Scottish ministers, of course led by Alex Salmond at that time, but included Nicola Sturgeon and the current deputy uh, leader, uh, John Swinney, uh, were all found to have breached sections 10.1 and 21 of the Freedom of Information Act for refusing to, repeatedly refusing to ask, answer questions about the Holy Gregg case. You couldn't have anything stronger. No, you can't. Now, Following that, you would have thought that the Scottish government would do something about it, but they didn't. And they ignored the Information Commissioner's ruling and, and until the 11th of July, when they faced uh, the criminal charge, all the ministers, including Nicola Sturgeon, faced the potential criminal charge of contempt of court for failing to address the issue, address the ruling that the, uh, the uh, Information Commissioner, Mr. Kevin Dunian, had, had made. And it's, this is also there on the 11th of July 2011. You'll actually see an article uh, again from the firm, and the heading is First Minister in Missing Records Riddle Over Holly Gregg Abuse Allegations. It couldn't be more clear. That doesn't end there because um, I actually wrote to uh, Mr. Salmon's office in uh, 2014. I kept at it all the time because I knew he was trying to cover things up. And um, I actually managed to get a uh, a copy of a letter that came my way uh, from uh, Mr. Salmon's office, uh, whilst he was First Minister, to his own constituency secretary, Mr. Neil Bailey. And uh, this is what uh, Mr. Salmon said. It was, it was, it was issued by his uh, Deputy Private Secretary, a lady called Lynn Forsyth. And it reads as follows. Dear Mr. Bailey, thank you for forwarding your letter received by Robert Green on the 14th of January 2014, in which he states that Mr. Salmon did not respond to the Information Commissioner's request for information over his conduct over the Holly Gregg case. I would like to assure you that the protection of children in Scotland is a key priority for the Scottish Government. I would also like to assure you that the Scottish Government complied with the Information Commissioner's request for information on the 28th of January 2011. Now, clearly, that has to be incorrect. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a lawyer, right? The, the ruling was now the 26th of May yeah. 2011. And uh, I got uh, subsequently got a letter back from the Information Commissioner, and this was dated, coincidentally, 26th of May, but in 2014, um, just remember that the, the, the First Minister is telling his own constituency secretary that he complied with the Information Commissioner's request on the 28th of January 2011. And this is what the, the Information Commissioner said to me. I've got the letter in front of me. As I've indicated previously, the information was requested on the 28th of January 2011. The requester subsequently sent a reminder on the 13th of February 2011. As no response had been received, the requester asked the ministers to carry out a review of their failure to respond on the 10th of March 2011. It could not be clearer. Mr. Salmond has even lied to his own constituency secretary about this appalling case. It's staggering stuff, this. Um, it is. Now, you may well ask that before, he had been involved in the, in the media, why that was not the number one story in the Scottish papers. Can you imagine? Uh, the the uh, First Minister and all the cabinets coming, breaking the law over the rape of a disabled girl and facing possible criminal charges. Criminal in 24 hours have, have been charged. And it doesn't get in the press. 
Well, I didn't get into the press because Mr. Salmon's uh, solicitor, a man called Peter Watson of Levy and McRae, threatened broadcasters and editors all over Scotland that this case had to be had to be uh, covered up at all costs. The and there Scottish is, um... people were not to be told what the Scottish their own top elected representatives had done over this horrible rape case. Now, Robert, there is, again, there's documentary evidence to show that Salmon's solicitor contacted the broadcasters. This yeah, is, this yeah, is a fact, but, right? Uh, the, 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 that is the case. that we, we have actually got to say that there's been contact, although I have, I have to say uh, I won't embarrass the people concerned. I have spoken to three editors about this, and they all confirmed that, um, the, uh, that, that this was indeed the case, that they had been threatened. That they'd been told, basically, you're not to talk about this, yes, you're not to investigate this. Absolutely, absolutely. This case was so hot that they felt that they could, they, that the, the Scottish people had to be kept in the dark over it at all costs. Now, this is what's really interesting about this, and when I say interesting, I don't want to sound heartless, because we say no. interesting, and it's, uh, it's about a young girl's life and yes. her mother's life. So when I say interesting, I'm not being in any way heartless. But what, you know, from a purely... You know, academic or a purely journalistic point of view, what's really interesting about this then is later on what happened to you. Um, yes. But you're coming to understand that what was really going on here was a wider paedophile network, a network of individuals that were yes. pandering and passing around uh, children. Now, you, um, you're excellent, so I don't have to repeat this for your benefit, but for the audience's benefit, I want to mention that at this point, uh, Robert won't be mentioning any names, we're not going to be doing that, for his own sake and for our sake, but we're going to talk about your learning that there was a wider, deeper conspiracy at work in that area, abusing children. Talk to us about that. Well, I, I believe it was. I, I think the uh, actions in trying to cover up the case were so drastic, and then the subsequent actions about throwing me into prison were uh, an indication of that. They had to stop me at all costs because it, uh, it wouldn't make it. They had to be sort of powerful individuals uh, involved in this case. Otherwise, the draconian actions taken about me, taken against me, would make no sense. Um, what I did, and I talked about this, uh, uh, I'm just going back chronologically a little bit now. Um, in uh, 2009, on the 8th of September 2009, I managed to persuade, after a lot of pressure, the uh, Scottish police to reinvestigate the case. And uh, again, I repeat, they had all these expert documents in front of them. They, know the, they knew the Criminal Injury Compensation Authority had paid Holly out. Uh, so they had all this evidence, they'd, had the, they'd got the police letter as well, that was all there in the possession of Scottish police when they interviewed Holly on the 8th of September 2009. I was present, and I'd like people just to, to think about this, because I'm sure this is something that most people have never experienced in their lives, and I, I hope that they never do. I listened to Holly Gregg being interviewed for three and a half hours for, by, by the police. It was held in Shrewsbury because the Scottish police came down, but because they were living in, in shops at the time, uh, they came down to interview Holly. And the inter interviewing officer was uh, DC Lisa Jane Evans. And over that period, Holly was absolutely magnificent in naming and giving locations, precise locations, of the people who she alleged had assaulted her. And of course, by this time, the police themselves had a, a record to show that the police themselves regarded us as an entirely innocent victim. So they knew at that time, if there's a victim, there's got to be at least one perpetrator, at least one perpetrator. Robert, uh, uh, Robert, let me jump back in. Let me jump back in. Tell us about that testimony without, without obviously, of course, again, name and names. How did it sound to you listening? How, how did she sound uh, in terms of what she was saying, the credibility of it? Uh, did it sound oh, natural to you? Was it absolutely oh, something yes, that you yes, got? Yeah, go course. ahead. Yes, that's true, Richie. Um, you see, I, of course, I'd heard Holly. Um, Holly had been on done a few interviews before, including some with the media, with the BBC, who were going to do programmes about it until they got threatened. Um, but Holly had uh, had um, 
was very precise over that time. She does have speech difficulties and she has some hearing difficulties, but she was very, uh, very precise about locations, what people looked like and so forth. You just take into account that she does have some speech difficulties, but um, she was quite clear about everything that had gone on and named people very clearly and also named seven other children she had witnessed. She said she had witnessed being assaulted. This is unbelievable stuff, this again for somebody who hasn't heard it before. Story. Staggering stuff, yeah. I just want to do a quick, um, very quick recap. 29 minutes to the top of the year. If you've just joined the programme, Robert Green, as the uh, anti-child abuse campaigner, is on the line, former Nobel Peace Prize nominee. We're talking about Holly Gregg, the staggering case. The unbelievable amount of evidence to suggest that this girl um, was raped uh, repeatedly, that she was um, raped by many people, by several people. Um, the doctor's um, testimony, the psychotherapist's testimony, all the police evidence, everything that we've talked about here, all of this documentary evidence, and even evidence that suggests, uh, and we know that Robert did pass this information to former Scottish First Minister Alex Hammond, who um, hasn't, to this point anyway, uh, come back to Robert or addressed any of this, and neither has um, Nicholas Sturgeon. Uh, why they've done that, we don't know. We can speculate, and Robert has speculated because uh, he thinks it's part of a wider cover-up. Um, this is staggering, staggering stuff. It's staggering stuff, this. For people who haven't heard it before, I have uh, I came to this information through davidike.com when David was reporting on what happened to uh, Robert. Uh, even the interviews with the police that you're describing, Robert, um, harrowing stuff I mean it must have been harrowing stuff to listen to it made you even more convinced of the credibility of the story and of Holly and, well, um, well, I, yeah. I, I had no doubt about the credibility because the evidence was already all there not just what Holly said as I say it's all the experts who supported Holly you know all independent of each other they were all giving the information having examined Holly and all the rest of it physically and uh, uh, psychologically and so forth. They've given all that evidence and everybody absolutely supported her. So who am I to argue with top professionals who have uh, uh, had looked at her and uh, investigated her? I'm not qualified in any yeah. of these matters at all, but they are and they're the top people in their profession and they're acting professionally and impartially and that was the opinion of all of them. So there's, uh, and when I say about the fact that the no rape victim could possibly have more supporting evidence than Holly, and uh, of course, uh, you know, the we we quite clearly we have evidence that there was a, a very serious cover up at the highest level. Uh, now, basically, what happened to me is is not important in comparison to what happened to Holly, but. Uh, in 20, 2009, we did get up to the this uh, detailed. Um, uh, uh, interview with Holly and the police having all the documents and by this time the First Minister having all the documents. On the 4th of December 2009 I got a letter or Anne, uh, Holly's mother got a letter that said they weren't going to do, the police weren't going to do anything about it because of insufficient evidence. Insufficient evidence. Staggering stuff. Staggering that, for you to well, read that, right? With, 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 the, with the tranche yes. of documentary evidence, right? Yes. Well, yes. Uh, now, what ha what happened was that uh, we also the letter said that um, the, uh, the, the the independent counsel had given advice that uh, they, they couldn't go ahead on this. Now, I'd already got uh, an idea that that independent counsel was none other than the head of the legal system at the time, Elish Angelini. Uh, so, on the on around the 19th of December, having had a few discussions with Anne. I decided to ring up the Crown Office, which uh, Elise Angelini was at the time in charge of, and I got through to uh, the a lady who's uh, the head, I think, of the Sexual Abuse Unit, Kathleen Harper, QC. And I said, I can't believe that this case has been blocked. There's so much overwhelming evidence, and people have been named quite clearly, and named clearly by the experts, who all certainly talked about at least one of the people as a prime suspect and nothing has happened. How can this be? And uh, I said, who is this independent counsel who had uh, told the, uh, the police, who seemed to have told the police to back off on this? And she said, to, after I put a bit of pressure on her, she didn't want to give me the answer. But after a little while, she said twice to me, she said, it was the Lord Advocate. It was the Lord Advocate. That Lord Advocate was Elie Angelini, who I might add, was actually the um, 
head of the uh, the, the, uh, the procurator fiscal, the main prosecutor in Aberdeen, back in 2000 and 2001, when Holly first re re reported, re reported the abuses. So in no way could she be an independent person because she was looking at the case in which she had previously been involved in. Well, she had to recuse herself because it, yes. Yes, it, it could reflect very badly on her if it was to come to light what happened to Holly. Questions would have oh, been levelled. So. Why, why so. did you not proceed with the prosecution at that time? Exactly. It just gets even filthier and murkier is, the, the more you go into yes. it. In fact, we've since had, uh, Angelini, of course, uh, told the courts when, when I was arrested and so forth that she had nothing to do with the cases and we've got documentary evidence to say that she had said categorically she had nothing to do with the case, which was a lie. And fortunately, um, uh, after I'd twice been thrown into prison, uh, on the 28th of April 2014, the former Justice Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, and he was the Justice Secretary at the time, gave a public attend a public meeting in Perth and one of the uh, the people there, the uh, very brave Scott, who's done wonderful work called David Scott, uh, made a question, uh, posted a question to him in the hall which was recorded and he asked him a question about who was responsible over the, the Holly Gregg case and Mr McCaskill to everybody's astonishment said it was Elise Angelini, she decided the allegations were false and this case should not be taken forward which only corroborated what Kathleen Harper, you see, had told me several years earlier. Consequently, Mr. McCaskill actually wrote to my MP, David Mowat, concerning, con 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 in relation to that, and later we, I had a letter in writing from the Scottish the Criminal Directorate in Scotland confirming exactly what Mr. McCaskill had said uh, in, uh, in Perth on the 28th of, of April 2014. So we have all that. I mean, it is just absolutely staggering, uh, the, the documentary evidence that we have to support this. How difficult was it for you? I know you're very, very um, decent and you're not, you've never, I've again looked at what, I spent a lot of time today going over things and there's no sense of you in any way trying to get any publicity for yourself. There's no sense of that at all. None no, of it. No, no, that, 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 that and can I finish that point? Just let me finish that point just very quickly because it's an important one to make in an era when independent media people often use people like Melanie and Holly and others as their props to further themselves. This is not you. And what's staggering about that is you've never looked for any sympathy or you've never you know, screamed from the rooftops about your own incarceration. But how difficult was it, though, Robert, you know, well, to be, to well, be put in prison for asking it, it, questions, it, it, really? It, it was hard, but because I, I got incarcerated because uh, I, I couldn't get any politicians to support me on this. I was obviously trying everything to get it. We did get some publicity from um, the, uh, the News of the World, the old News of the World in Scotland. Uh, an article was published on the 19th of April 2009 by James Mulholland. And the Shropshire Star, which was uh, Holly and Anne's local paper, also did some useful pieces. And there were some useful pieces from my own local paper, the Warrington Guardian. But generally speaking, the media seem to be frightened about doing anything like this. The BBC promised to do anything, to something about it, and were warned off. Uh, that was back in 2009. And what I did uh, when we found that the when I found the uh, Scottish uh, police were not going to do anything is. I stood for Parliament. I decided to stand for Parliament in Aberdeen South. Um, I'd never been to Aberdeen before, and uh, up for the 2010 general election. And uh, I subsequently, on the uh, um, the uh, in uh, February 20, uh, 2010, there's a 2010 general election. Um, because nobody knew me and uh, nobody knew about the case, because there'd been more of a blackout on on the Scottish media on it. I uh, went to, uh, to Aberdeen and couldn't get any of the other candidates to speak about it. Uh, I went to Aberdeen and I uh, said I have a press conference, any media want to come, any people in the public would like to come and talk to me, ask me questions, see what, if they like me or believe what I was saying, please come forward and talk to me. And uh, I uh, made it plain that I would be uh, at 10.30 in the morning outside Marks and Spencers on Union Street, which is the main street in Aberdeen. But just before I got there, I was suddenly pounced on by two plainclothes police officers. Um, they put handcuffs on me, threw me in the back of a police car, and then took me to the police station, and I was held in solitary confinement without any legal representation for four days, and charged. That's disgusting, isn't it? It is, it is astounding.
Um, I asked for legal representation. They said they were going to charge me. And uh, they said, I said, well, surely my human rights are being infringed here. I'm in an alien country with no one to, uh, no witness, no independent witness, no solicitor. And one of the policemen made the um, statement that uh, has lived with me ever since. And he looked at me coldly and said, this is Scotland. And don't you come here talking about human rights. We don't have them here. <laughs> you have to listen to that sort of garbage. Yep, yep, yep. So there we go. That, 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 was, that was the first time. Um, and I have to say, I, I was, uh, again, I kept at it. And again, I was grabbed from my home in Cheshire uh, two years later and thrown into prison again. Um, that was the, uh, that was, again, because I was pursuing Mr. Salmon for his failures, basically. Um, and at the time when I was in prison, that was the time when uh, I got the, uh, the commendation to be uh, um, the, the uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, which you, you mentioned earlier on. Now, I'm not not one to read about because it, it's, it's a bit plastic. It embarrassed me a little bit. But I will read you some of the uh, the points that were made, not necessarily to do with me, but because of the failures of the Scottish uh, establishment. And I'll just briefly give you a paragraph here, which I think is very important. Um, it comes from a senior member of the House of Commons whose identity I still don't know. I'm not supposed to know, and I, quite honestly, I can't tell you truthfully, I still do not know who it is. But this is what he, had to, he or she had to say. Even as I write this nomination, Robert Green is in prison in Scotland, having been arrested for at least the third time by Aberdeen Police on the 13th of February 2014. These repeated arrests have been despite the fact that all Robert Green has campaigned for is for Aberdeen Police to do their job and properly investigate Holly Gregg's allegation of child sex abuse. A matter of great urgency, since whoever abused Holly Gregg is likely to be still extensively abusing other children. This is the word of the MP. He also goes on to say that the disturbing pattern of repeated arrests of Robert Green by the Aberdeen Police suggests that the arrests are a means of obstructing and stopping Mr. Green's campaign for the abusers of Holly Gregg to be brought to justice. Contrast the speed and intensity with which the Aberdeen Police have pursued cases against Robert Green with their sheer reluctance to interview the suspects and victims named by Holly Gregg. Consider also the fact that if Holly Gregg's allegations are true, then there is a fairly large number of child abusers who are left free to continue abusing other children in and around Aberdeen and perhaps further afield. Those are the words of the MP who uh, recommended, who uh, put me forward for the, uh, the, the award. He couldn't be more blunt, could he? Couldn't be any more blunt. And no, of course, of course, our listeners will want to know, obviously, a couple of important um, uh, yes. questions. One is the the well-being and the whereabouts, if not geographically, but whereabouts and in terms of, um, you know, are, are are they okay? Are they comfortable? What about uh, Holly yes, and her mother I, I today? Understand they are. I, I, I believe that um, they, they are uh, living in, in Shropshire and are in safety at the moment. So I, I think, I hope that the ordeal for them is finally over but of course they have not uh, they have uh, not justice. obtained justice yet and I have to say that throughout the campaign when I was helping Anne a lot Anne was very unselfish about this of course she wanted to protect her daughter first of all but she said the main thing is she says I, I, Holly to a certain extent is safe we hope nothing will happen to her again but I do not want any other mothers to have to go through what I have had to go through the people these people should be brought to justice can I just say something which has been on my mind when we've been talking about this? Yes. Because of what we've covered forced adoption on the programme, isn't yes. Anne somewhat fortunate? Um, and this is in no way now to cast any doubt on Anne's, um, what Anne has said, because I believe it, haven't looked into it. But isn't she lucky that Holly wasn't taken away from her? Uh, yes, I guess she was, actually. Um, that th there is a little bit more that I can't sell uh, on uh, publicly about this, but um, uh, let us say she w she was lucky, though there was an attempt to take Holly away from her, which was very sinister indeed, I have to say. But I, I can only say a very limited amount about that because of legal reasons. Robert, you believe, don't you? And I I've interviewed people on this program who share your belief. You believe that currently today, very early into the year 2017. Yes. Hello? Yeah, sorry, something happened there. Yes. 
There was an extraordinarily loud noise on the line all of a sudden. Oh, uh, right. So, well, it's probably... It's probably <laughs> it may be the, uh, the Scottish police or <laughs> somebody representing Mr. Salmon who doesn't like what I had to say. Well, well that's staggering that, because... Probably isn't. <laughs> do you know what? I'm going to declare this. That was a third-party interference on this phone call. Right. There's right. no doubt in my mind. Right about when I was yes. going to ask you. And it nearly blew yes. the ears off me because I'm wearing cans, obviously. Right. And it's nearly blown my ears off. Right. I'm I'm a bit absolutely shocked there. I've never experienced that before. But right. I'm not well, I'm, 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 I'm not expect, expect any dirty tricks from the Scottish authorities. That's extraordinary. I, I wonder did our listeners hear that if they did tweet me. But before um I don't want to waste any more time on that for the moment. Yes. You believe that currently, right now as you and I talk, there exists yes. an international and a national paedophile ring with very yes. important and very powerful people working yes. within it, abusing children and rendering children, taking children from one place to another for the purposes of abusing them, and that the vast majority of people yes. in the United Kingdom have no idea uh, about, yes. the about the scale of that. Go ahead. Yes. Well, th that is so, and uh, I, I think that is probably the case. I think it's difficult to actually say that that is not uh, the situation, because obviously there have been, been great pressure on all sorts of people who've tried to speak up. Look at the Jimmy Savile case. Nobody dared to see. He was at it for 50 years, by all accounts, and all the people who worked with him seemed to know about it, but not one person had the guts to speak out about him when he was alive. Nobody in the mainstream media made these allegations whilst he was alive. And the only person of any standing who had the guts to speak out was a person who is often mocked by individuals in the mainstream media, and that person is David Icke. He spoke out while, while Savile was alive, and he was the only well-known person to have the courage to do so. And if you hear about anybody trying to uh, put David down, just remind them about that. Where were you when Jimmy Savile was raping children? Not to Simple mention, of that. course, not to mention he named Edward Heath and uh, uh, George well, H. Yes, w. Yeah, Bush. That's yeah. another, another issue. I know he did mention that too. Instant, well, what I should say is, in the Aberdeen area, there have been other cases, and ca cases actually taking place now where the similar kind of cover-ups are taking place. I would ask people to look at the case, the terrible case of the Doherty family. I would ask people to look at the case of the disappearance of Sean Ritchie, Mysterious, a young man disappeared on the Halloween night on the, um, uh, on, in 2014 in an area very close to where the Doherty family uh, reported likely sexual abuse. There's been the persecution of a devoted father in Aberdeen called Malcolm Ogilvie, and there's been also been the murder of Claire Webster, all in this same area, and there are other issues as well, but those are just four which uh, I would say would uh, would be extremely suspicious indeed in the way that those cases have been dealt with and are being dealt with at the present time. We'll, we'll get you back on in the near future and we'll talk about those cases. We're just about running out of time now. I want to um, remind our listeners, Robert Green has been on the line to us and um, we've been talking about Melanie Shaw and what happened to Melanie last week and where she is and why hasn't there been any announcement by the so-called authorities as to what she was convicted of and and, and, and of course Beechwood Children's Home Robert's been talking about uh, the Holly Gregg case which is a national scandal uh, there's no doubt about that and um, I'm, I'm glad that he's come on the programme to talk about that and of course the wider issue of um, paedophile rings operating here, there and everywhere uh, rendering um, children and, and abusing children and doing so uh, it would appear at the moment with immunity from prosecution. Yes, yes well, this, if I can just, I know we're running out of time now, uh, Richie, but I should just mention some of the other quite important, again, which shows uh, the, uh, the strength of the case. On the 20th of February 2013, I was invited down to Operation Utley's headquarters in East London. And I was interviewed by two officers, very good officers, um, called um, DS Nick Troon and DS Sean Richardson. They were, seemed to be very well briefed on the Holly Gregg case. They wanted to go over all the facts with me. Of course, I gave them copies of all the, the, the key documents. Uh, and uh, they actually wanted to investigate again in Scotland. I didn't, they, it wasn't just the uh, when I uh, asked, got the reinvestigation in 2009. In 2013, the same thing happened again. But this time, it was the police in England who wanted to investigate. But the officers told me that in order to set up an investigation in Scotland, they needed the permission of the Scottish authorities. 
And I said, well, that's wonderful if you get it, but do not forget that the current First Minister is implicated in this case. I think you will be blocked. And that is exactly what, and that's happened. what happened. The Scottish authorities refused operation, the, the officers from Operation U3 permission to go ahead and investigate Holly's case. That goes to show how bad things are and the support that, we ha- that, that, that we've had, even from the police here in, in Britain. I can't criticise them for their effort, for the lack of effort. Robert, that's brilliant. Just finally, in the 20 seconds we have left, where should people go to find out more about what you've been doing? Uh, well, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of um, things that they can look at. I don't have a, a, a blog of my own, so there's nothing that I control, and that's deliberate um, at the present time. But there are quite a lot of things. I mean, you'll often find lots of things on the UK column, who've been very good. Uh, I know David has been very good in many ways, David Ike, and Holly Gregg Justice is worth having a look at as well. I say none of these are controlled by me in any way at all, but there's quite a lot of information on those. If you just want to read about some of the things I've been talking about, many of these documents are in the public domain, and uh, if you want to uh, just satisfy yourself just having heard me talk about it, you can actually read a lot of these things for yourself. Great stuff, uh, the I would urge everybody to do what they can regarding Mr. Mr. Salmon and Mr. Sturgeon. I think they're two people who it's probably the only case with the paper with, with you can actually absolutely certainly uh, tie in the national leaders. Well, we'll um, certainly I be do asking not think them. those people are fit to be in the offices that they can now hold. We will certainly be asking them to explain why they haven't, um, you know, answered the documents that they were given, why they haven't uh, made a statement about the documents given to them by you on this case. Thanks for coming on the programme. I have no Thank doubt you, you'll be on again soon. And um, sincere congratulations to, all the, um, um, to you for all the work you've done and, and sticking up for people like Anne and Holly and others. I really mean that. Thanks, Robert. Uh, thank you, Richie. That's very kind of you. And thank you to all the listeners. Fantastic. Good Robert Green on the line to us there from Warrington. And um, as he said there, um, his work is documented. You just need to put his name and Holly Gregg into a search engine. <coughs> Excuse me. And you will find out, or you will find links to his work. Like I said, if you go to davidike.com and you put Holly Gregg into the search engine, everything that's ever been put onto davidike.com is archived. So you'll get loads and loads of links to uh, information there. It's